to the Megillah Project. One story, many angles. Come learn with us. As an ancient historian, my main area of interest is the world of ancient Persia, the Achaemenid Empire. And of course, therefore, I am uh, routinely engaged with the Hebrew Bible, and in particular, the Book of Esther, which, of course, has great resonance uh, for the kind of research that I do. I'm currently writing a book um, on Esther uh, and the way in which it reflects the reality of the ancient Persian court. And that's going to be my main emphasis today. Uh, and I'm going to take a look in particular at the royal harem of Persia and how that is uh, um, spoken to in the text of Esther. Um, beautiful image here to, to begin with of this uh, gorgeous uh, Achaemenid royal woman in uh, the shape of a, a little cosmetic flask. Uh, we have very few representations of women in Persian art. Um, they don't figure very prominently at all, unfortunately. So what we do have is very rare and worth studying. Now, I wanna provide a little bit of background to the talk I'm going to give and my essential thoughts on Esther summarized very quickly for you. Now, to begin with, um, I do not think that Esther is history. Esther is a kind of historical fiction. If you like, it's a sort of folk tale written by uh, a Jew uh, in Susa around about 400 to 430 uh, to 350 BCE. So that is during the latter half of the Achaemenid Empire itself. I say that because I think that Esther is full of Persian resonances. Persian words are used in the text itself, but also this author has a very good knowledge of Persian court society. So I would say he's a high ranking Jew who has access to uh, Persian court, but is creating really a kind of fantasy, um, a, a riff, a, a kind of um, uh, a, a tale uh, set in the court which privileges Jews and their position in Susa. It has, a, for me, a very confident ring about the Jewish identity within Susa and the Persian Empire. Now, the whole of chapter nine, I believe, is a later edition. It has a very different tone to it. Um, the stories about the origin of Purim and especially about the violence that erupts um, in the empire has a very different, I would say, Maccabean tone to it. So I would say it's an edition at least 200 years later after the original folktale. Um, but again, this doesn't concern me too much. Editing, redaction is something that we find constantly, of course, in our biblical sources. And I still maintain that the bulk of the book is fourth century BCE, written in Persia, written for a Jewish audience familiar with the Persian world. Now, my emphasis here then is on the historicity of the Book of Esther in what it tells us or how it interplays with the historical resonances of the Persian court. And my focus now is on the harem. Harim is actually mentioned seven times in the Book of Esther. Um, chiefly, you can see here in Esther, chapter two, which uh, in which it, it dominates. Um, this, of course, is when um, we hear of Esther's arrival uh, at the court in Susa and how she enters into the harem, and how actually she kind of goes through a kind of finishing school of etiquette, court etiquette, and then progresses after her meeting with the king to another harem, a second layer of the harem. You'll also find that as we speak of the harem in each of these seven occasions in Esther, um, then almost inevitably the figure of the eunuch comes into play as well. And we do know that eunuchs, these castrated men, were prominent players um, in the Persian court during the Achaemenid period, um, the fifth to the fourth century BCE. And they are represented sometimes in art, as we see here from this re relief from Persepolis in Iran, these beardless young men carrying purse prune flasks and towels. And they obviously play an influential part in the story of Esther alone, but perhaps that's for another time. Thinking about harem then, we need to think about the terminology and what do we mean uh, when we say harem? I think it's a, a very cliched word and yet it's a word that we have to use um, in the absence of anything else. Now harem in its true understanding of course can be a physical space in which 
um, a household, uh, especially the family members, were housed. So women, children, servants, close kin men, blood relations. It's kind of the inner sanctum of a house or a palace. It can also refer to this group of people together. So the blood kin, when they're grouped together, um, are a harem. And therefore, a harem doesn't necessarily need defining walls. Okay, But also, the word harem, of course, is, is at the root of it, is an Arabic word, which means uh, taboo. That means to say, by implication, a space into which general access is prohibited, or a group of people which are out of bounds to an individual, um, or a sort of behavior as well. Fatima Manisi, who is a, a wonderful um, anthropologist and sociologist of the Arab world, speaks of a concept of the harem of the mind, that is to say, a kind of code of behavior um, which makes you behave in a certain way, um, not um, getting involved with people that you don't know, not speaking to women who are not part of your family, not um, inviting men into the home if they're not belonging to you. So a harem of the mind. Now, in the ancient world, we have lots of words which seem to suggest harem. And interestingly, all of them are kind of spatially aware. So in Assyria, for instance, the Akkadian word bitat or bitsinashati means the interior or the woman's house or the enclosure. And interestingly, in Hebrew, the chief word that we have in the Hebrew Bible is uh, penima which means the inside. We don't know what the ancient Persians used for their word for harem, but it must be something similar as well. Interior, place of seclusion, place that is taken away. We need to blow a few myths out of the water before we continue. The first of all is this. The royal women of ancient Persia did not live in a kind of Islamic style purdah. They were not hidden away from people. They were not denied access or denied um, uh, power. So we shouldn't think of them like the women of Mughal India or Qajar Persia or the Ottoman Empire. And we certainly must not think of the Persian harem as a kind of Hollywood orientalist fantasy, you know, the kind of kismet effect, all right? We need to put that out of our minds entirely. The harem, as far as the ancient Persians were concerned, was a highly organized hierarchical structure which operated around the figure of the great king. In this case, of course, uh, Xerxes, uh, uh, Ahia Cyrus. The women of the harem were carefully guarded for their chastity, but that does not mean that these women were dislocated from interaction with other parts of society, or that they lacked any freedoms or indeed autonomy. They could have their own estates. We know that this is the fact. They could own their own wealth. We have evidence in plenty, in fact, uh, from uh, Persian sources for this too. One thing that really operates in the concept of harem the idea of visibility. Now in our world, our media mad world, we have this idea that to be famous, to be rich, to be wealthy, to be powerful, you have to be visible, you have to be seen. This is co totally contrasting to the idea of power and prestige in the ancient Persian world. For members of the royal family, especially the royal women of the Persian household, invisibility was key to their prowess. To be kept separated from the public gaze meant that you had honor, prestige, and status. There was no honor in being seen routinely by the common people. Invisibility did not equate to lack of freedom or to a lack of power or wealth. And I think this really helps explain the core story at the beginning of Esther, when the king calls Queen Vashti to his drunken banquet in, honor to in order to show her to his people, his visitors, his guests, Vashti refuses. And she refuses because her honor is at stake. And what this is saying at the beginning of the book is that Xerxes is a dreadful king. 
he should never be asking his wife to display herself in this kind of way. The code of harem pr prohibits that. So Xerxes is out of order. He's breaking all the, all the expected norms and his followers merely pay lip service to him. And they say, yes, of course you should appear because you've commanded it. But really in a civilized court society, he is acting uh, grotesquely. So my central argument about the, the role of the harem in Persia, which we can see in Esther, is that the harem had a profound political importance. The shenanigans between Esther, Mordecai and Haman are a kind of folk motif version of the kind of political machinations that the harem encountered in the reality of Persian society because the maintenance of dynastic power was transferred through the harem, because it was in the harem that women gave birth to sons and daughters, especially the future heirs to the throne, and guarded that throne vigilantly. Now, we have to remember that the Persian Empire was essentially a family-run business. Dynasty really mattered. And the focus of that dynasty was always on the harem, the domestic heart of Achaemenid royal life. Now, structure of the royal harem in Persia is quite complex. We need to remember that in Persian society, kings and nobles were polygamous and polygynous. That is to say, they had, could marry many women, but they could also keep other women as part of their household, concubines, female administrators, female slaves, all of whom were sexually available to the kings or the nobles. Now in Esther, while we have a hint of that in the stories, of course, of the concubines who are brought into um, Susa, by and large, the story of Esther is one of serial monogamy. We hear that Vashti is replaced by Esther. We don't get any sense that around Esther were also other wives, of course, and many other concubines. That's the reality. And I think our author of Esther kind of wanted to narrow our focus down to Xerxes, Esther, Mordecai, and Haman, so that this kind of um, foursome uh, becomes the central theme of our understanding. The other character who is conspicuous by her absence in the story of Esther, but in historical, in historical terms takes precedence, was the king's mother. Because of course, a king could have many wives and even more concubines, but could only ever have one biological mother. So it goes to reason that in the royal court, she took precedence over everybody else. Now, beneath the king's mother, we have the rank of a favored wife or a chief wife. We don't think that this was uh, a codified way, but as the book of Esther says, kings can find favor with a particular woman. And this really is part of Esther's success. The king found favor with her, our text says. So she becomes the most favored and therefore the most influential of his wives. Of course, within the harem, there were also other women, daughters, royal sisters. These all made a part of the royal harem too. And we know that in Old Persian, the word for these women, all of these women of the royal family together, was dukshish, which literally means a princess, or dukshishbi, which means princesses. This kind of structuring of the court, the harem, is indicative of any kind of sophisticated court structure. And we find a similar thing. Thing, for instance, operating in China during the Qing period, where we have a highly formalized, systematic um, regulation of the ranks of women in the imperial household. We find exactly the same thing going on in Neo-Assyria, um, Old Kingdom and New Kingdom Egypt, in Han China, and in any sophisticated court society, of which, of course, Persia was most certainly to be included. So we have this um, hierarchy uh, structure 
we're seeing something of the hierarchy in the rare images we have of Persian women. Um, here's a little uh, clay cylinder seal, a very small image indeed, being magnified, and I've done here a line drawing for you, where you can see the structure of the royal harem is depicted in status and dress. So clearly the highest ranking woman there is the woman seated on the throne with her feet on a footstool. She wears a long veil, a crown, and she sniffs a, a lotus flower or a, or a pomegranate flower. And she's been attended by a young girl with a pigtail who's giving her a bird. Then there in the center is a, an incense burner. And then we have another woman in a crown with a short veil, but standing up before the seated woman. I suggest here that we have a uh, queen mother sitting on her throne, uh, a young girl, a concubine, or maybe one of the king's daughters, and then standing with her crown, one of the king's many wives. The whole scene, in fact, reminiscent of the kind of audience relief we have in the male section of the Persian court, where the king receives visitors. Very reminiscent of the layout of this particular piece of iconography. Status is also emphasized in this rare piece of textile, which has survived from Achaemenid Iran as well, showing women before an altar. Again, a taller woman with a crown and a long veil, and behind her, shorter, with a crown without a veil. And this seated female figure is also found on another seal, we have here where she's being offered wine in a jug to be poured into her cup. And again, she's holding a lotus blossom or a, a pomegranate blossom and seated on a high backed throne. In the Brooklyn Museum of Art, we have this little terracotta relief showing uh, a woman, possibly from Susa and dating to about the time that Esther was written. And here we see a high ranking woman, possibly um, a queen. The idea of the crown is repeated twice in Esther. Interestingly, Xerxes is never depicted in Esther as wearing a crown. It's the women who wear crowns, according to the author of Esther. So first of all, when we're introduced to Vashti, there she is wearing her royal crown. And later, of course, that's taken away from Vashti and given to Esther. So the crown becomes a very potent symbol for Esther's rise to power. What are we talking about when we think about the Persian crown? Well, then it's probably like this. This is a tiny little head made in turquoise, which is now in the National Museum of Iran in Tehran. And it shows uh, a woman uh, wearing this crenulated crown. That motif was found in pre uh, Achaemenid periods. So on the left of the screen, you can just make out there the crowned head of a woman belonging to the Elamite period. At the bottom of the screen is an Assyrian queen wearing a mural crown. And on the right, we have a Parthian queen wearing the same kind of mural crown. This crown is supposed to represent the, uh, the wall that goes around a city. The Greeks used it for the figure of Oikumene, the goddess of the world herself. So it has imperial ideas attached to it. The ideas of rulership, the idea of um, high status as well. You can see why in the Book of Esther, this crown becomes important. I want to go back to our structure of the royal harem and Counter now another strata of women who become very important to us, of course, in the book of Esther. And this is the idea of concubines. Royal concubinage in the ancient Near East was a very important aspect of uh, life. Now, kings in the ancient Near East collected women on a large scale. Sociologists have called this Darwinian style polygyny, because if you think about in the wild, um, for instance, a, a lion will group around him many lionesses with which he will mate. In a Darwinian style, therefore, what we see happening in human history amongst the richest and most powerful men is the accumulation of wives. 
So I'm giving you some example here, um, Ninurta uh, Tikal Ashur of Assyria at the beginning of his reign, when Assyria was still a small power, had 40 women in his harem. On the other end of the scale, in the Sasanian period in Iran, when Iran was at its height, the king Husro II had 1,200 women. Zimri Lin, uh, the king of Akkad, at the beginning of his reign had 44 wives. At the end of his reign, he had 232. That's because as he became um, successful in warfare, he captured women as part of war booty, but he was also given to them as tribute. If we look at the historical books of the Hebrew Bible, the story of Saul and David, we can see really the progression of the um, uh, of the monarchy played out through the women of the royal court. So we know, for instance, that Saul had two women in his court, um, his wife and a concubine. David, of course, we know has seven wives, and we are given, at least in one section of the book of Samuel, ten concubines. Solomon, of course, who is supposed to be at the height and glory of Israel's empire, has um, 300 wives and 700 concubines. And as the empire shrinks um, and splits after Solomon's death, um, the Bible tells us that Rehoboam, his son, had merely 17 women. So rise and fall scenarios are played out in the number of women who are accessible to a king. We know that in the ancient Near East, and this is a Persian source here, that women were often acquired for the king through war or through tribute. So here we have uh, a scene here where Artaxerxes III conquers the city of Sidon in modern day Lebanon and takes the prisoners, amongst the prisoners, the women who are sent to enter the palace of the king. Now, not all of these women became um, concubines, many of them would just have been slaves and administrators, but the lucky women, the beautiful ones, the ones who could be trained up, became concubine. The other um, way in which kings could select women for their harem was through a selection process. And of course, in Esther chapter two, we have this idea that a search goes out for young virgins across the empire who are brought back to Susa. Now, this might sound like something out of the Arabian Nights, but actually it's a well-attested practice in the ancient world and beyond. So for instance, in uh, Qing China, draw that analogy again, it was a very common practice, almost on a yearly basis, for the different provinces of the Qing Empire to send the most beautiful girls to the court where they could be chosen for their beauty and health, trained, and then enter into the harem as slaves, concubines, or even as wives. You'll also see in the Book of Esther that there were strata, levels, of the royal harem as well. When Esther goes to see the king, she doesn't return to her old harem. She advances in the court and goes to a second harem. So it would seem to me that the harem in the book of Esther reflects very accurately the, the hierarchical structure, the very strict codification of um, gender um, interaction that we have in the Achaemenid world proper. As to the number of concubines within the Persian court, well, we don't really have much of a, of a clue. Um, we are reliant on the whole on Greek and Latin sources. Um, so, for instance, Herodotus says that the concubines who accompanied the king were too numerous to count. Uh, Dicaiarchus says that there were 360 concubines at the Persian court, one almost for every day of the year. And that's agreed upon by Diodorus Siculus as well. Perhaps more accurate is the fact that we know when Alexander the Great conquered Iran and took the royal household after the Battle of Issus, included amongst the booty were 329 concubines, which of course became his. And Plutarch, says that the guarding of concubines and the preservation of their chastity was very, very closely done 
amongst the Persians. Merely approaching and touching a royal concubine, he says, could lead to the death penalty. Why so many women? Why do kings need this amount of women? Well, of course, it's to do with the fact that the kings need to reproduce. The hierarchy ensures that the queen or the married women are the highest ranking women in the court. And uh, one Greek text tells us that queens were treated with great reverence by the concubines who bowed to them. But concubines were chiefly used for sex, not sex purely for pleasure. Sex for the Achaemenid king, like any absolute monarch in a hereditary dynasty, was never just about pleasure because sexual congress had political consequences. The birth of heirs really mattered. When several women in the royal harem had children, had sons, they of course became competitive amongst themselves because they wanted to push their sons to the order of succession. They wanted to promote their sons as the next king, as the heir apparent. So what happened in the bedrooms of kings, queens, and concubines had huge effects on the um, trajectory of the empire itself. But through sex and the propagation of many children, the king trained his power. Here is the Sultan uh, uh, from Africa and the Cameroon from the 1890s. And he chooses to have himself photographed here with all of the children that he has borne on his wives and his concubines. It resonates, of course, power. Now, one thing I want to show is that historically speaking, concubines were not defunct women. They had opportunities to rise to the ranks of the harem. And we know that Xerxes' son, Artaxerxes I, was married and had a legitimate heir, but also he had many concubines. And some of these gave birth to children, one of whom, uh, you can see her name is uh, Cosma Tardine, gave birth to Darius II. In other words, it means the role of a concubine would suddenly change. And a concubine can go from one of the lower positions in a harem to a position of high responsibility. She could become, in fact, the king's mother. Interestingly, our story of Esther doesn't tell us anything about Esther's fertility or whether she gives Xerxes um, a child at all, although in later Persian and Jewish um, folklore, um, she does indeed. But I hope what you've seen here is the idea that the Book of Esther does encode within it some really interesting factual ideas about the Persian harem, and that Esther is not at all separated from the historical process. Esther may not be history, but it reflects very clearly the reality of Persian court life. <laughs>